So good evening, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, depending on, on where you are. Um, um, and I actually, uh, yeah, I guess to, to, to present this information with you, I'm um, coming to you from uh, Everett, Washington, which is uh, just north of Seattle on the uh, Pacific uh, side of the United States. Um, and what we call a center of excellence product manager, with especially in temperature. So a long time ago, uh, as an engineer, uh, and I've got a engineering degree and a business degree, both, and an extensive amount of time uh, with temperature products, the acquisition of Heart Scientific in 2001 or two. So a bit of experience there, and I've worked on our international markets in the last 20 or so years. So with that, let me jump kind of a little bit into what we're doing today, and uh, I'll do a little bit of a brief discussion about why we would automate uh, temperature sensor calibration. I think a lot of that might be obvious, but I also cover it anyways. Go through three of the uh, three sensors or different methods of doing it. There are ways that we here at Flute Calibration um, have to help you automate your uh, your sensor calibration. And we'll go through the setting up of each one of them as best we can via this media, which is uh, a computer play and audio. Then we'll at the end we'll a little bit discuss a little bit about the differences, the cons, the pros. Uh, they believe a perfect automation solution that fits everybody. So one of these will work for different applications, but it may be less than optimal for for, for applications. We'll just kind of go through that. So uh, about a we automate. You know, and I think the first bullet here is, is um, be more productive. It is pretty that's the one that people gravitate towards and. Uh, that's the one that's the most obvious. You know, time, temperature calibration, there's just no avoiding it. It takes time. Uh, to um, any sort of calibration, it's almost always got to wait for the set that you're, you're calibrating to achieve temperature uh, and then uh, stabilize and equalize with the environment with which you're measuring. And, and, and of what that sensor is, they all take time. You know, some sensors are very slow responding, and you know, it might take even though it's you know your heat source is at temperature, you might actually need 20 to 30 minutes for the sensor to cap or stabilize and equalize, and it just takes time. So by automating it, and actually, you know, the automation system looking at that um, that that stability or equalization. And then while doing that, you, you're free to go do something else. That uh, might be some other um, task that you have in your laboratory. Uh, hours, uh, our technicians often will start off at a temperature point, and then they'll go on to some other uh, probe, one that they just started uh, uh, is, is running. So that's a fairly obvious benefit or, or purpose for doing automation. The other one, uh, which is consistent, I actually think is the the more important and the more significant um, rating. If you're, if you're calibrating with an automated system, that automated system is do the same thing time after time after time. There's no good, there's going to be any variation in what the process is that is regardless of who's doing the work or when that work was done. So what they allows you to do is to actually compare the results from different calculation runs and know that they were done under nearly identical uh, uh, stances and done nearly in, in identical way. So that if you're looking at a drift or an out tolerance that you might have received, you can be certain that that's not because the 
either forgot to do something or we didn't wait long enough. So it really allows you to to, to consult and then be consistent time after time after time. And, and calibration is perfect. There's always going to be some calibration error, but if we can reduce the errors due to uh, one from one run to the next run, you know, we get we to get better calibrations. So uh, automation really has the benefit of getting more, you know, and being confident that what you're doing uh, is correct. So that to me is really a, a far, you know, the more important uh, um, quality job, uh, and that's the benefits that automation really does for you. What I'm going to talk about, about one of using uh, a, a handheld tool um, called a 754 documenting process calibrator, and I'll go through this uh, of uh, connecting it to a heat source and then calibrating a, a full K type thermocouple. Uh, we use what we call our 1586 Super DAC, and I'm going to connect it to a portable map. Uh, to, to give it an example of what you can do with it, and we'll we'll show you what it would do to calibrate, you know, uh, you know, sanitary sensors or uh, say any type of. But I'll use it sanitary sensors in this uh, example. Last one, we'll use a more fully automated solution with something called uh, MetTemp2, which is a software product that we produce that runs on a computer, and we'll go through and show how to calibrate multiple probes. Uh, Using the software to calibrate correction coefficients or the result of your calibration and printing certificates. All these are fairly straightforward solutions. The way I've ordered them from one, two, and three are really what I would consider, you know, good, good better, and best. So as we move forward to these solutions, they will become more um, complete in terms of what they offer. They also become more complex as well. Um, in, in mode. Let me kind of outline this first solution, which is using that 754. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take a 754, uh, which is an instrument in the photo on the left the, with the yellow case, and we're going to connect it to a uh, 9144 drum well. Uh, the 754 will actually configure the test, run the test, and collect the results uh, all on its own. Uh, the 754 is done. If you uh, would like, there's a, a software product that we offer called DPC Track 2, which would allow you to manage the results, uh, store different types of tests, schedule when you're doing uh, calibrations, uh, and so forth. So this is a part of a, a more inclusive, a little bit of a, an inclusive package. Package. Uh, no, of the 754, it's um, it's part. Of, it's really a general purpose tool. That's I would call it a little bit of a part of a uh, a, a voltmeter or a DMM handheld DMM along with a uh, source or a calibrator. And it, it does more than its temperature. It will also do volts, amps, ohms, frequency. Uh, this picture here shows it being connected to a pressure source, a pressure measurement device, and a source, which is that hand pump, and doing a pressure calibration. Um, so that hand device is a fair, fairly powerful uh, tool uh, to use. It's designed to go out into the field and help you calculate instrumentation that's uh, located on site, uh, capture those results, document them. All we have having to carry around a computer and lots of pieces, lots of paper. We have a product that we call uh, DP Track 2. There are other software products that this thing plugs into. Uh, there are products from Fish Rosemont, Yokogawa, some of the larger uh, transmitter manufacturers, because they use this, they recommend this tool as a, a uh, maintenance and calibration device for their field transmitters. So, so if you've got a Rosemont system on site, you know, they would be simple adding uh, 
their their software driver for our product, then you can integrate it into their their plant management system. As you can truly handheld product, it's meant to be uh, taken out in the field, so it's 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 built to be rugged. Um, well, the other thing that it does is if you have digital transmitters that communicate using the heart communication protocol, it is able to communicate and talk with those things and do basic uh, setup and configurations of those devices as well. The electrical, the analog part of this, it's, it's worth understanding what the capabilities of measurement and sorting are, so that gives you an idea of what you can do with this thing. Uh, it's very much like a voltmeter in that it does AC and DC voltage and current. Uh, it may have the same range as some of your handheld meters, and a lot of those meters go up to 1,000 volts, but 300 is certainly pretty adequate in a lot of our, our, our press plants, and 110 milliamps certainly covers the most common 4 to 20 milliamp range. Uh, free as well if you've got some sort of a, uh, maybe you have a micro motion flow controller or something like that that outputs a frequency. Things you can see are, are thermocouples, uh, ohms, RTDs, and then a variety of different pressure modules. Those are all on the measurement side. To do any sort of uh, calibration, you, you really need to have a source and sync provides, you know, voltage, current, frequency sync, as well as was simulating thermocouples, simulating uh, resistance and RTDs, and it will provide power for a transmitter. So it's a general purpose uh, tool that you could use out in the field when you're, when you're maintaining a lot of your field instrumentation. I'm not actually going to use, um, if calibrating a temperature sensor, you, you have some kind of source of temperature. Uh, not, you can't calibrate a sensor with pure electrical means uh, unless those electronics are being used to drive a heater uh, or cooler, and therefore, I guess you could consider the heater and cooler being electrical. But we're going to use, um, an example, a 9144. Uh, this is a part of three different heat sources. They, they look completely, in fact, I couldn't tell you from this photograph which one this actually is because they're all identical. But the, the, the differences are they have different temperature ranges for which they cover. You know, the unit will get you down to minus 25. It's got a really hot unit that gets you to 660. And then the unit that's in the middle. Uh, so depending on what your temperature needs are, you, you can pretty much cover a lot of the ranges with with small, uh, relatively small portable uh, device. Uh, it's fast. It's um, uh, as I said, it's a it's a dry well, which means we're we're, we're essentially heating uh, a a block of metal with which you're going to insert your probes. But we can reach the temperature extremes from ambient uh, in about 15 minutes. So getting uh, usually is is longer, but still getting from to my 25 and 15 minutes. Uh, actually achieving a minus 25 temperature is, is pretty quick. Uh, getting up to 660 in 15 is also pretty quick. Um, the accuracy of this, this is the, the, the calibrated accuracy of the temperature that you see on the display, which includes you know, lots of errors in terms of uh, the stability of the heat source, the uniformity of that heat source, how loaded it might be, hysteresis, um, and long-term drift of the of the, the control sensor, those sorts of things. Um, about two tenths of a degree for the cold unit and the middle, uh, the, the mid-temperature unit, and um, three five. And I, I really shouldn't use the word about. That is what we actually call uh, maximum instrumental error, which really is all of the error sources that, that we can. Um, we, and we follow a, a, a pretty standard uh, guideline. For, for due calibrations of this device and our, our specifications, which is uh, a Euromet uh, uh, calibrating heat sources. The depth of this device is about 100, it's not about, it's 150 millimeters or uh, 5.9 inches if you're an American. 
And off to the right, we've got uh, photos of a variety of different standard inserts that allow you to choose a, a whole size that's appropriate for your sensor. And one of the critical thing when you're using these devices is that you need good thermal contact with the wall. Uh, and so you need an insert hole designed and cut to fit the probe you're calibrating. We do not recommend using any kind of fluid or thermally conductive material. And so one of the things that's a uh, good practice is to keep this these wells as clean as possible uh, to prevent uh, some errors that you can do to do contamination or, or the, the worst one would be getting a probe or a device stuck inside of the, the probe as you have uh, thermal expansion or contraction uh, through the heating cycle. So keep these things clean. Uh, if one of our inserts isn't pre-drilled for the size of probe you have, contact us and we'll do, we, we'll, we'll do custom build inserts uh, with them quite a bit all the time uh, for people that have maybe a slight odd shape, maybe it's a tapered fitting or something along those lines, and they want good thermal contact in their well. And we've, we've got quite a bit of experience doing that. Uh, when using that 754, you don't just have to be using the dry well that I'm using uh, in this example today. You have a variety of, of, of different temperature sources that are compatible with that 754 from small little handheld devices for quick um, and maybe less accurate calibrations, or maybe you need, uh, a thermocouple furnace, maybe you need to get up to a couple, you know, a thousand degrees or so. Uh, so we've got a device that can do that for you as well. So there's different um, or different accuracies or stabilities of your heat sources. So there are a, a range of devices that you can choose that connect with the 754 just fill out and make your calibration task easier, dependent upon the heat source and the requirements that you're looking for. So here's an example of what we're going to go about, what we would do. There is a cable uh, that we use. It's called the Heart Drywell Accessory Cable, and it connects the 754 to the serial input on the 9144. We, to start this thing up, we're going to connect uh, the draw to the, the uh, set four. Then we're going to install the thermocouple sensor into the heat source. I've got that picture in the last uh, footing. And then we'll connect that thermocouple to the, the 754. And we'll power everything up and, and, and start going. For those who are interested, there is a application note that we've written about this more in detail and gives you some ideas or some reasons why you might want to do this. And that application note is called Illuminating Sensors and Loop Calibrations. And it, it's really to, to try to help people understand that in all situations, the largest source of the error in a control loop is the sensor, and not calibrating that sensor. Sensor, you're you're potentially missing a significant portion of the total error, and so calibrating that sensor, um, whether a pressure sensor or in this case a temperature sensor, you get much better control and you can eliminate uh, a lot of the the total error by including that sensor in your, your calibration. So we've connected the the. 754 to the heat source via a serial communication. The 754 is actually going to measure the, the output at thermocouple, the millivolts, if you want to look that way. It's going to command and, and uh, uh, the, the dry well to go to the appropriate temperature. So it's going to actually control the dry well and source physical temperature through that device. Uh, I'll just kind of go through a couple of quick slides here that, that, that talk about how we might do the, how the configuration goes. And what I've done on these slides is basically given you a screenshot of the display of the 754. When the, the, you've got this configuration running, uh, you really never have to look at the display of the dry well. 
uh, it might be interesting for you to troubleshoot the system or to do some other things, but, but really everything you need uh, to, to do, operate this is completely done from the 754. Once you've turned on power and, you know, and made the connection, the, the dry well is really just a dedicated slave and we'll go through and do that. So when you 754, it powers up with a screen that looks like this. Uh, if you look at the, on the screen, it tells you that the source is off and it's doing a, uh, a voltage measurement. Uh, in this case, we've got nothing connected to the voltage terminal, so that voltage looks like pretty zero. zero. So the first thing you want to do is configure your measurement, which would be as simple as uh, going through a couple of buttons to select what type of temperature so you're going to use use a thermocouple. Uh, if you've got a thermocouple selected, what type of thermocouple, like a, in this case, a K thermocouple. That's done. The display will switch over and start re giving you the readings in temperature. And a bunch of other little things that will provide for you, like it tells you what the internal reference temperature is. Uh, for those of you who care, it will give the ITS 90 millivolt, compensative millivolts that we're reading. Um, but it basically the, the main focus is the large in this case 23.4 degrees on the display. So it is uh, configured. You've told the 754 what we're measuring and how to measure it. You want to turn around and switch over and, and tell it a source. Uh, in case it starts off with off, and you're going to want to tell it to source through a dry well, which is a temperature. So then you comes up and you, you can either simulate a thermocouple, simulate an RTD, or source real temperature through a dry well. And if you select the dry well, the first thing it will do is it will attempt to communicate with that dry well. And the 54 it has got a fairly robust communication protocol built into it. It's actually going to go out and um, try to find any one of the compatible devices, and then it will go through and do at a variety of different rates. So it actually will, for those of you who know still communications, it will do what was called what's called an auto baud uh, connection. Uh, and so all you really have needed to have done is is connect the cable and uh, if connected properly, uh, the 54 when it's done attempting a connection, will make a connected screen like this. It will be the model number in this case a 9144. So I'm connected to to that, uh, and we have already we the set point that we've driven that 754 is 154 degree, 150 degrees, but it's currently measuring 23.4. So that configures the source. We actually go into a split screen where you can see the the measure value and the source value, uh, and from here. I uh, can start configuring what that test looks like. like. So there's a different strategies. Uh, you'll go through and select what type of instrument here. You'll notice that the 754 does a variety of things, uh, straight linear instruments, uh, switch tests, square root responding instruments, such as flow meters. I thought that Clay will say, okay, what's our measured source? And uh, measure parameters in terms of what's real to 100% on, on uh, measures the zero to 100% on source. Typically, uh, these are going to be the same uh, in this case. So we've got 50 to 250 degrees for both what we're expecting on the source and what we're expecting on the measurement. You have these different if you're doing, say, like, like a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter uh, where you might source. Um, a zero or you know 50 to 250 degrees from the dry well, but you might measure 4 to 20 milliamps. So that's where these things may differ. Uh, the the real critical part when you're setting these things up is, is determining the the, the delay time. Uh, 54 is a, is a really great little instrument, but it's so it, it's very general purpose and doesn't understand um, what the time might take for the different heat sources to reach stability, and then, uh, importantly, for the test probe to have soaked in that uh, temperature source long enough for the temperature probe to have reached stability and equilibrium. So 
you don't want to, to put in a delay time here, and that's why I've got that delay highlighted, that's long enough for the heat source to reach its temperature and the probe to equalize with that heat source. Uh, there's no easy way for me to tell you how to do this other than I will say longer is typically better. And you might want to try this once or twice uh, while developing that procedure so that uh, you know that you've got the right uh, delay times. Once you've got all this done, you can store the procedure so you don't have to go through that, that again. You, you, can, you can configure as how many points you want to collect. Uh, in case, the test strategy is I'm using five ascending points. So that's going to start out at 0%, then go to 5%, 50%, 75%, 100%. So it's five points ascending. There's a bunch of different ways we can we can configure these things depending upon what you need. Uh, if you've connected this the D4 software, you can in and really customize. Uh, um, uh, S points are, are completely configurable from the computer. Uh, I've configured my test uh, and pressed to collect S found data. Uh, I come back to that split screen and notice that there's now an error being calculated. Now I know what my uh, what 100 percent of span is supposed to be, and I can look at the source temperature and the measured temperature and calculate an error as a percentage of span. So we'll play that error that's an indicator that we're in the we're a bit, we're we've test configured or calibration configured. There are a couple of ways we can do this. We can do an auto test, a manual test. The manual test might be something you would use while you're developing that procedure. That manual test allows you to manually step through each test point. Most people, once they've got it developed, will run the auto test uh, and just press auto test, test, and then walk away because you don't have to touch anything until the, the, the calibration of the test is completed. At what these results might be, and in this case, we had 500 our test points, and it was um, 300 seconds. So what's that? Uh, 15 minutes per point. So it would have been, you know, 15 times five minutes to get to these results. Uh, all stored in memory, and it can be storing in a variety of different results. In this case, on this example, I stored them under my initials WWM, uh, and I did the report uh, for the test at. Uh, uh, 3.43 p.m. So I can look at that, you know, select that result by going through the list, uh, hit go to results. In both results, there might be an as found and an as left. Uh, with couples, typically, since you don't really do an adjustment on a thermocouple, there's rarely an as left, or the as found can look like the as left. Um, found here. And first thing we'll do is it will tell what the test result, the test procedure was, what we ran through, what we used, and here are the actual results. So you can actually look at the source uh, values, the measured thermocouple values, and the error as a percent of span off to the right. Anything that was out of our tolerance, which we specified as three percent, would be highlighted. And we've got everything well within that uh, that three percent, so everything is passing. We can seven and fifty four to uh, to different software products. Uh, the one we offer is called DPC Track Two. It essentially is a database, so you can uh, store and uh, results, store test procedures, schedule tests. Use it to load and unload those results into your um, calendar. Uh, once the results have been uploaded to the computer, so you can do a lot of uh, report management, uh, printing uh, reports, and managing calibration data, looking at uh, sharing one result uh, time so you can look for drift or looking for out of tolerance or uh, those sorts of events, the kind of things you would do with managing calibration. Calibration data. Questions on that solution? Okay. 
Kelly, we did have a question come in. Um, it is will Metcal run on the 754 and dry well? Uh, we don't. The Metcal is does not support either of these devices directly or natively. Um, they that Metcal was really meant to be more of a laboratory type, electrical type of calibration. Uh, so it doesn't focus on field um, installation like this. Uh, and therefore, we've never we 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 never really included it into it. Metcal would be appropriate for calibrating the 74. So if you had appropriate standards in your laboratory, you could use Metcal to automate the calibration of the 54. But it really it does not uh, connect, and you wouldn't use it as a tool to maintain uh, records or calibrations in the, the field with the 754. Next question is, when using the 754 to connect the dry well, are you using the dry well's temperature sensor and accuracy, or is 754 measuring the temperature using the dry well sensor? Okay, so uh, what the, the way this works is the 754 will say temperature set point command to the dry well, and then it reads the display of the dry well for the source temperature values. So the dry well's internal controller, internal measurement and display, if you want to look at it that way, are the temperature reference measurements in the system. Um, so, that is, so that's where I, in one of the earlier slides, I, I purposefully put up the uh, display or the maximum instrumental error of the dry well so that you, that's the error of the heat source uh, and the components of uncertainty for is measuring the output of the UUT or the, the thermocouple. Okay, uh, the question is, does the DCP track to come with the gold plan? Um, so I'm not really certain what happens with that. The 754 actually comes out of a different division of Fluke. I don't really manage that, that division. I don't know whether they offer gold hair plans for that product or not. In our division, the calibration division, most of our products do have gold care plus tools group does in terms of uh, warranted or annual calibrations, whether they have a package for doing that. I would suspect they do, but I don't know the specifics. Okay, thanks, Holly. Um, let's see. Next, Jen. Just one moment. Um, how can we get the offset point on the dry well calibrator? The um, point, I'm not 100% certain I understand that question, but what you're doing when you're configuring the test through the 754, the 754 is going to calculate, and the example I used was 50 to 250, and said, Twenty points in an ascending. To choose zero percent, which would be twenty-five degrees, and then value would be two hundred and fifty degrees, and then there'll be three or there will be equally spaced points in between those that will be set points. So you're actually setting them on the controller on the seven fifty-four, and then it's commanding the dry well to reach those temperatures. Okay. You're getting the dry well or the heat source from the front panel of the heat source. Oh, great. Uh, I wanted to remind folks, if you have questions, please send them through the chat window to the host. And, and in using the QA, I know it's kind of confusing, but um, it's easier for us to manage your questions if you send them through the chat window instead of the Q&A window. Um, we did have another question. While, or a comment, I'm not sure which it is. Maybe we'll have to seek um, clarification. But the statement is, we 942 and our loop calibration and looking on HMI screen for the reading using a 754. Does that, I'm um, not sure I understand the question there. Do you? So it, it sounds like they may be using uh, um, uh, computer control system that's looking at the output of a sensor um, 
and we are using the heat source to, to drive that. Uh, that would be, um, there are ways of doing that, but you're not going to use the 754 as a method to automate that in that case. You, you potentially use the drywall and have to manually uh, uh, set up drywall and then use whatever the computer control or computer display, HMI display, uh, read the output of your system. Um, you, you're doing, you're writing some, some, uh, some kind of a procedure on your HMI system to do so. Okay. Um, let's see. Do we want to um, keep going? Questions? There's a few more, or come back to them at the end if we have. Let's able. come back at because I don't want to short the other solutions in terms of time. Um, so let's come back to those at the end, and then when people if people are, are are really interested, we can we'll we'll, we'll we'll go beyond our normal time. But I don't want to um, I don't, don't want to short the other solutions in terms of people that might be interested in seeing what those look like. Okay. Great. Well, the other the other method we have, and give you a little bit of a, a flavor for that. This is automating um, using what we call a 1586 uh, super DAC, and I'm going to connect it to a, a one of newer product products, a uh, 7109 portable calibration DAC. Um, those two products, the 7109 is on upper left in the photo, and the 1586 is on the upper right. And that photograph that shows the print of the uh, UTs, in this case, sanitary sensors, and there's four of them placed into the fixture inside of this bath. And then I've got a reference probe uh, stuck there right in the middle of all of those. So uh, connect that reference probe to the front panel of the uh, 1586, those banana plugs on the front. That's called channel zero. And then the output of the sanitary sensors, I'll connect to the top golden uh, connectors across the top of the uh, 1586. And those will be, in this case, channels 201 through 204. Uh, so this differs from the one earlier. First of all, the, there's a, there is a reference probe that we're using. We're not going to be using the display of the bath whatsoever. In fact, we could put a piece of paper or cardboard over that display and our procedure wouldn't even know we're doing that. The other advantage is that we're using a fluid here as the test media, which means I have uh, an insert specifically drilled to fit my test probes. Um, I contact with the liquid, which is actually, by the way, a much better contact media than uh, a gold hole. And people, it allows us to get a lot of different size sensors. So maybe your sensor has a, a, uh, a turned hood or a bend in it, or, or maybe it's a threaded um, uh, like, like you, you might find in a, a um, um, application or uh, aircraft where you actually, the sensor is actually threaded into a, a process bulkhead or a process fitting. Uh, things will, would fit much better in, and, and operate much better in a fluid because they've got much better thermal contact. The other notice here is we have the ability of, of to as many as 40 units UT. So you can do a lot lar larger number of probes. In this case, I've got four. Uh, you're going to do them all, all. They're all identical. They're all the same. So you can uh, a, a much bigger increase in productivity. Uh, the other solution, the 754, there was really only one input. Uh, it was an input, one output. Um, we've got one, one source, but we've got multiple uh, inputs that we can use. When we're done, uh, to, uh, the, because in the 1986, we'll connect a USB memory stick uh, to transfer that data over into a PC um, and uh, that will come across in what we call a CSV or comma separated value format. Goes straight into a variety of different programs, you now like Excel or or a lot of other database or analysis programs um, for for documentation. We're not not direct, We're not going to use any computer or any, any software. Just the instrumentation to record the data 
and, and operate the uh, the test. A little bit about what this 1586 does. It's a uh, temperature temperature recorder. Primary job. It's got. It's been specialized to do, do a very good temperature measurements. And do thermocouples, RTDs, PRTs, thermistors. It, it will do the the raw voltage current resistance as well. Uh, speed is about 10, 10 samples per second. Uh, so we had forty samples connected. It would take us about four seconds to get all to all of them. It's got very good measurement performance. Uh, you're a, a, a digital voltmeter guy. This is the equivalent of a six and a half digit voltmeter. Um, our T's, we do a lot of things for resistance, says uh, um, true current reversal to remove thermal EMFs and a bunch of other nice little tricks to improve your resistance or, or measurements. And our P's and thermistors, um, we could do with, with uh, you know, five. Um, of accuracy on a PRT or two bullet of degrees on a thermistor. Uh, thermocouples, you can measure them using an internal reference junction. And when you're doing that, the, the, the error of measurement uh, on a thermocouple is three tenths of a degree. And you could improve that substantially if you needed to with uh, the addition of an external reference. Um, the error in that three tenths of a degree is due to the, the, the reference junction. And electronic reference junctions really just aren't very accurate to begin with, so uh, are, are not accurate. So you can actually improve that quite a bit with an external reference if you need it to. The modern uh, device, um, when I 40, there's actually 45 inputs. There's a, a one on the front panel that's, that, that's uh, part of the connectors. And then there's a couple of extra connectors on the um, a couple of the connectors if you wanted to do do dedicated current measurements. Two different ways of connecting your wires to it. Uh, the photograph in the center there is what we call the high capacity module, and that's designed for more fixed field wearing, uh, a temperature chamber that you validate or you plug devices into, and it's a fixed wiring uh, setup. Uh, that would be an appropriate connector for that. Uh, the the uh, Bob's what we call the external DAC stack. It's got very flexible uh, connectors, spade lugs, bare wires, banana plugs, uh, those sorts of things. Just very push button, easy to use. Left side of this device, uh, um, 20 bytes of data internal. And then if you need to expand, if that's not enough, you can expand it with uh, external USB drives and get, I think the maximum uh, X USB drive we can connect to is like 32 gigabytes. So typically more memory than anyone's, most people are going to use in their applications. The ability of controlling fluke, fluke drills, um completely for automated calibration, and a bunch of other things, a nice real-time display um, charting. Uh, and if you're in an industry that requires uh, some sort of digital signatures or uh, built-in data security, uh, Six can accommodate and help you with those sorts of requirements. Uh, we're getting a bath here. And I purposely chose a bath in this example because this device is actually probably better for the accuracy that you get from a bath. You can use it with a dry well as also, but the bit performance is such that it's really well matched when you're using any of our 35 different baths. So we have a number of baths, and we can cover a pretty significant temperature range with different baths. Again, we're using the same dry wells, the dry wells, micro baths that are with the 754 you can use here also. The provision to use non-fluke heat. So if you have a, a heat source from one of our competitors, you incorporate that in into this system, but it just won't be as automated. You'll have to go over to that heat source and manually input the point. But once you've done that, the 1586 will handle all the tasks 
associated with waiting for stability, measuring stability, uh, measuring the reference, and then the UUTs. And once it's ready to go on to the next set point, we'll just tell you it's time for you to enter the next temperature value on the uh, third-party heat source. So you can do it. It's just not as automated. So I have a photograph of the actual connection. So I, I pulled something out of our manuals. And it's a, a serial cable that's connecting from the back of the 1586 to the front of the heat source. And got a UUT and a reference probe being placed into the heat source. So you, you do connections. There is a application note uh, specifically written about automating temperature sensor calibration using the 1586. And it will go through this uh, process in significant detail to help you um, lead the process. So all probes would be connected to the input of the 1586. The reference probe is connected to the 1586. We configure and control the test 1586. We're not going to touch any of the buttons on the source. And the results will be stored in the 1586 memory. Again, I've got screens uh, on the 1586 to kind of walk you through how we would configure that. So the setup, again, is done from the screen to the 1586. In this channel one, we've put the reference probe, and I would need to define how it's measured in that channel on. Uh, and so that's the result of what I've done here. I've defined it as a PT385 reference probe. The test bit at a different blank of group of channels. I would probably turn all of the other channels off and just have the channels with the UUTs on. And these are thermocouples, uh, thermocouple reference sensors. And so I, I would set them up as on and then define them for thermocouples and possibly give them a label. That label could be a serial number or other uniquely identifiable name. Once that, I'm going to define what my test parameter is. So I'm going to do an automa automated test. There are ways of running scans in this thing, and automated test is one of them. I am a fluke heat source. I want to make certain that, that my control heat source is on. It tells the 1586 that I've got a heat source that I want to control with this test. If it were a third party heat source, I would turn that off. The other thing I will point out here is notice that I've got two different reference channels. Um, in this, I'm only going to use one, and I've defined that reference to be sitting on channel one. I have multiple reference. Uh, would help you uh, with different types of measurements or lowering your uncertainty if you need to. And what that measurement looks like, I will define each of the individual set points. And so here is where I've defined set point one. And you can see you've got five different set points defined here. I'm showing you only, channel, only set point one, which is at this point, uh, 50 degrees with a tolerance of one and a stability of a tenth of a degree. So this is telling the 1586 is that I want to be at degrees plus or minus one degree of tolerance. So anywhere between 49 and 51 is acceptable. And once I'm in that range, I want my stability to be at least a tenth of a degree. And one tenth of a degree stability, I'm going to tell you six to soak or wait for 10 minutes before I take data. This is a much more flexible way of determining when ready to take measurements than with previous solution, where the previous solution, all I really had was a countdown timer, and you had to do, you had to do a little bit of uh, initial testing to see whether you had the right time parameter. Here, you know, I, I basically specified what range temperatures I want to be at, what the ability needs to be, and then I programmed in a delay time before I make measurements, and that delay time will be What's this, what you need for your probes ability. On that, I can start the scan. 
this is what, it, if you notice, it says scan up in the upper left corner of that display. Uh, I'm ready to run. I hit the start button. And see that uh, my display will change. The recording will turn on because I've defined recording to be on. It's, I'm running an automated test. I'm currently at point one, which is at 50 degrees and settling. This is the display from the, the 56 that will tell you your status, uh, where you are in the test. What's up and waiting for settling, I actually monitor, which is what that monitor button is, monitor the reference probe. And I can see that the reference probe in this example is cooling down. It's way down to 50. The other I can look at is I can look at statistics on that probe on the ref could give me an idea of how close I am. Am I at set point? It's my uh, stability bed. And so it looks like I'm 50 and stability is about 0 0.02 degrees or 0 0.03 uh, on a sample size of 11 readings. But this was just an idea that I'm probably in that countdown period and ready to go. One of five different pipes. Uh, I'll plug in a memory stick to the front of the 1586, like in this picture. I'll turn the files that were inside of the 1586 over to that memory stick, bring files over to the computer, and use the, and it adds what the data looks like. With it, there are two different files. There are a setup CSV file, which records configuration data, and there's a data file, which can, uh, contains, uh, I'm going to show you what they look like in a uh, an Excel spreadsheet. So these are, you just see, uh, you can just open these strip on that memory stick, or you can copy them to a local drive and then open them. But when you open them up, this is what they look like. Uh, the file on the left contains all of the configuration details, the set points, uh, what the measurement in Inputs have been configured for it. Can serial numbers of the units uh, that I'm using for measurement when they were calibrated. So I've got traceability there. On the right hand side, that's the raw data. You see each record, the time stamp, and the measurements from the reference panel and the two or the three units under test. So you can you can go through and, and see all of your data. Questions here. Um, folks, if you have questions, a uh, reminder, please send them to the host through the chat window, and um, I'll, I'll um, forward on to Wally. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we are recording this session. Um, I've noticed that we are running late. We're at the top of the hour right now. If you have another commitment at the top of the hour and have to leave, uh, please don't worry too much because in a few days we'll email you the link to the recording, and then you'll be able to rest of the recording <clears throat> later. We hope that you can see with us, but don't worry too much because we'll send you the recording of the full station. Okay, well, the first question is, will the 156 accept an info connector that's used on a Fluke 1524 for a standard PRT? Um, we have an adapter that will allow you to take any of our, our any of the probe terminations. We've got a variety of adapters uh, that will allow you to connect it there. Uh, the 1586 does not understand the intelligence built into that connector, so you'll still need to uh, come in the, the questions that would normally be with those connectors. The one thing with the 1586 that is nice is you can you can program those into a library. Um, so you could say, for example, you have serial number one, two, three. You could go to the library of previously programmed probes, bring serial number one, two, three, and coefficients will be restored. So you can you can do that quickly like that. Uh, with a, save a, a test configuration, all that information gets saved in the test configuration, so that um, all of that all of that stored. It, when you calibrate the probe, you need to go back in and change those configurations, uh, those those calibration coefficients. But you can connect if our, our probe through adapter uh, to this 1586 without having to remove the existing termination. 
Okay. Uh, last question, is the USB drive version two or three? Uh, version two, it's compatible with any, with, with most uh, memory, memory sticks. There are a couple. We actually, inside the 1586, use a Linux operating system. Uh, and so Linux actually is what defines the USB compatibility. There are a couple, and it's not very common, but we have seen one or two uh, USB memory sticks that don't have a driver in Linux. Uh, they're, therefore, they're, they haven't run. But that's really, really, really rare. Um, USB 2.0. No. Next one is a 1586 question. Uh, this, the comments this unit is made with a LAN port on the back, why do I have the option to set a file destination instead of having to use last drive? The reason we, have it, we didn't do this, first of all, it goes through a whole host of a variety of different network protocols. We didn't put that duration uh, capability into the 1586. That would have been a huge task. That LAN port on the back is designed as a remote control port. If you were to write your own software, you could connect it via a LAN, or the other connection would be a USB as well. But the, those those ports on the back were really designed for remotely controlling the 1586. You had to go to a file system. We'd have to understand the operating system and a host of protocols uh, before we could actually get uh, uh, to a file uh, externally. Okay. Uh, are you aware that um, uh, does the unit have any issues controlling older dual block calibrators and like older 7330, uh, 7320 liquid baths? No, it's, it's been tested and compatible with any product from Fluke or from Heart that has a port on it. If it's serial port, we can talk to it. Now, the dual wells, you have to manually select. Which side you're using? Because uh, like the 1586 doesn't know how to handle two heat sources at once, so you actually manually have to manually select the the hot or the cold side for a dual well before you, you can control it. Okay. Is there a way to multiplex the 1586A to multiple baths? No. Okay. Once at the time. Okay. Uh, question: Do all Will these auto systems have a way to trigger tech that the respective test for DUT done S? Not to understand that. Once you start these things, uh, they run until completion, until completion, and there is a there is a display at the end that will tell you that we're finished and done. Um, no external signal other than the display on the system telling you that we're done. Okay. Um, this question, does the 1586A interface with a computer or GIB or other face for external control purposes? Certainly, and there's, the, the, there's no GPIB on the 1586, but there is USB uh, and there is a, a, a Ethernet LAN port for remote control. Okay. Um, one for now. Does the 1586A require an ICE point reference? Does it require one that's got automated? It's got an automatic internal reference junction. Uh, that reference junction uh, gives you thermocouple accuracies of about 0.3. If you use an external reference junction, and you can, that error I've seen that drop down to as low as a, a somewhere below a tenth of a degree. So it's, you, you can tighten up that if you need to. Uh, to about a tenth of a degree, but it's not required. There is an internal reference junction um, that the will use natively. Okay, that's all of the questions in the chat window. I'll check the Q&A portion later at the end right. of the presentation. So over to the third solution. Remember, I'm moving from good, better to best. And this one here is the, the more complete solution. This is a software product. It's called MetDemp2. Uh, we're currently at version 5. And it's a software product that's uh, designed to calculate a large workload or a broad workload of different types of temperature sensors using many different measurement devices or therm thermometer readouts and a variety of different heat sources. Um, this has been around for well, version one, I think, was 
probably 15 years ago, uh, but we're at Version 5 now. And so it's been used by a lot of people uh, all around uh, the world over the years, uh, lots of uh, metrologists and technicians. In fact, our own laboratories, our own facilities use MetTemp to uh, do new calibration. So if you've received a probe from Fook that's been calibrated, there's a good chance that we actually use MetTemp as the automating software product for that probe. We use it in all of our factories, but we use it in some of our places. Uh, the, it's compatible with Windows 7 and 8. It's also compatible with 10. And what we did with the current version is, um, again, bring it up to compatibility with current operating systems. It has some support for a couple of our newer heat sources. Product, uh, you get what's in the lower photograph. So you'll get, uh, obviously, the CD. You can see the CDs are becoming kind of outmoded methods of delivering soft day. The one thing that the CD does do is it provides your license number. You can download the software from our website, and with the license number that's printed on that CD, activate it. The other things that you get are uh, is switch, an RS-232 switch, which allows you to connect to multiple devices at once, and you get a method for connecting switch to your computer, and the software will operate with this switch uh, to multiplex out to other devices. When running a calibration, so MET temp offers a wide range of, of sensors. So it will calibrate thermocouples, RDDs, SPRTs, thermistors. It even has a way to accept non automatable devices like, liqu like liquid and glass, bialics. And in those cases, what it will do is it will pop up a, 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 an, an entry screen where you go out and read the view from the liquid and glass or the other thermometer put in and hit enter and then it will go on to the next point. It handles sensors <clears throat> that can't be directly connected to a readout in that, that manner. It will range of different uh, different you have a, a large number of UTs. Uh, we could connect to as many as one hundred sensors at a time. So uh, do a lot of, of, of sensors. The real limitation here usually is how many can I adequately put into my heat source I've rarely seen a bath that can handle 100 heat, uh, UUTs at once. And then each um, temperature, each we can actually configure 40 different set points. So lots of different temperatures for uh, testing. The other thing this does is it, it incorporates both comparison when using the other examples, when you're comparing against a reference, as well as a fixed point calibration where I'm using a fixed point temperature device. Uh, an application of this might be if I'm calibrating a, a really good industrial PRT where I need to have a measurement using a triple point of water, which is point. And then I use comparison calibrations for the other temperatures. So I could actually say my first measurement's at, at the, using a triple point of water, and the system knows how to incorporate that measurement and then use the other baths or heat sources for the other points. So you, you can mix them, or you can do an entire fixed point calibrations. So uh, quite flexible in terms of what that's con that, that does. And then lots of different uh, equipment. So I'll, I'll go through different types of thermometers that we can use ha from handhelds to bench models, and then different heat sources from dry wells to micro baths to calibration baths and furnaces. And in this case, I can do more than one heat source in this configuration. So I could actually have up to four heat sources, each one dedicated to a different range of temperatures, and put that into an automated system. This connection or an hybrid connections look like uh, on my computer. I'll have the software installed. I'll have some kind of a communication support, either USB or RS. 232, and then I'll bring that connection out to my switch, or my smart switch, and then from there it uses RS-232 to connect to all of our other devices. The you know the readouts, um, for readouts, as different scanners that we can use. 
um, sources, which could be a mix of dry wells or baths or fixed point cells. And it even has the, way, the ability to connect to a thermal hygrometer so we can we monitor and capture laboratory temperature and humidity parameters when we're doing our calibration. It's not really programming it, it's configuring it. You don't need to know a computer language or anything like that, but you do need to be able to do, do and select what your reference equipment is, what your measurement equipment is, what the heat sources are. You need to be able to determine what your set points are and um, input your probes, which like might be model number, serial number, and owner, the, white, the probes that we're going to calibrate. Once done all of that and configured all of those things, it's when it's really just a matter of selecting them from a menu, uh, then can start that test. Notice they save as or open here, so I could have previously saved tests and open them and not have to go through this configuration process. Or if I've done a configuration process or I've made a change, I can save it. Uh, it saves onto your local local computer, wherever you might have your storage. When I'm running, I get a, a, a display here that this is our runtime display, which to uh, in the upper right of there what where we are in the test status. In this case, we're probably about so almost halfway done, <clears throat> and it gives a status on the right upper uh, screen tells us what the set point value is, what the tolerance is, stability, what heat source I'm using. A nice um, little display that shows me progress. Uh, and if I, you know, so you can see the, the current value, this is where I, I always laugh at the, the digital guys because I don't know of any heat source that really ever has those many digits after the decimal point of uh, of real measurement performance. But the digital guys say, well, we've got them, so let's display them. And they kind of ignore the analog reality. But anyways, that uh, you can configure the graph if you want to. Uh, you can only uh, um, uh, unprobe at a time, which typically would be the reference probe. So you can see test is progressing with your reference. And there's a little bit of uh, down to the, the lower left. If you want to just pop it into and ask, well, uh, the probes I'm calibrating, what's their current values? And so you can look at that with a, a simple request to, to the system. Results are stored into a database, uh, and when you, you, you've completed a test, I can bring up a test parameter, which is in this case a test number, and I can from there calculate uh, those coefficients as a result of the test. In this here, I'm calculating thermocouple coefficients, and so I see the coefficients in a residual screen where on the hand window of that screen, I've got the deviation calculated from the calibration. I have corrected ITS-90 compatible um, And then over the right, I've got a measurement of the set points and residuals when you're using this curve fit that we've calculated. So calculate coefficients for PRTs, uh, couples, thermistors, uh, a variety of different forms, uh, ITS-90, calendar Van Dusen, IPTS-68, State polynomials, or for thermistors, uh, the popular Steinhardt Hart um, linearizations for th thermistors. Done. You can also from from here you can print out reports. So an example of a report is on, on the on, on the cover on the left. This cover page is customizable. You can put logos, company names on it. Uh, you can actually put in customizable text in terms of. What you know, if you if you want to state make some statements of traceability, you can do that. Uh, but this is the ba most basic version that I have here. Uh, the actual measured values are in the intersection, uh, the coefficients, and uh, the equipment that was used for the calibration. Their serial numbers and when they are due for calibration, so you can that provides you your trace of some of your traceability information. Enable it, and you desired. We can actually print out uh, tapes, um using the coefficients that we've calculated. So you can have a, a temperature to millivolt table like this, or temperature to resistance 
uh, if you want to include that as part of the results, you can do that. Questions about Okay, thank you, Wally. Um, first question. <clears throat> can I transfer MET temp calibration data to MET team? Yes, you can. There is a pipeline that's been built um, that you need to have a, uh, a, a, oh, no, sorry, not MET team. I'm sorry. Met track. It doesn't. It doesn't work with the most current version of Met Team, but it does work with Met Track, and there is a, a table to transfer the data from Met Team Met Track automatically. Okay. Question: Is it possible to determine PRT coefficients according to you, i.e., depending on temperature range below zero degrees Celsius and greater than zero degrees Celsius? Well, IE, so IEC uh, will will, ref, will will reference ITS 90 as the current standard. So you can certainly calculate ITS 90 coefficients, which is the international temperature scale, and IEC would would reference that that standard for their temperatures. So I wouldn't say IEC. I would, would it'd be probably more correct to say IPTS Internet IPTS 90, uh, which is the international standard for temperature at this moment. An IEC, if it's a current IEC um, document, uh, it should have been updated decades ago to reference IPTS 90. IT 90, sorry. Okay. Next question: What is the process to customize these reports? Uh, actually, uh, it just uh, you bring up the report template. It's in it's in a Word document. Uh, actually, make your edits in that Word document. Save them. And away you go. Okay, terrific. Um, I believe that's the end of the questions in the chat window that I see right now. Let me look in the Q&A section in case it happened to go in there. Um, okay, um, seeing any specific to MetTemp2. Um, let me check back in the chat window one moment. Okay, um, Wally, that's like all the questions for MetTemp2. There were a few more um, on, on early solutions. So let me jump to those, um, and then I think we'll be wrap. Um, Spanish uh, from Hector. Hector, I apologize. I don't speak Spanish like Steve, your normal host, does. But I translate in Google Translate. And from what I can tell, I think the question is, is um, are these thermocouples more accurate than PT100s? No. Okay. Uh, thermocouples, standard thermocouples have an accuracy of a range of Three to seven degree to half degree. I should say standard. That's those are, are, are special grade ones. Standard thermocouples are usually plus or minus a degree to a degree and a half. Uh, T's. If you get a class A or a class B thermocouple, you're down to tenths of a degree, or or so. So PRTs are obviously much more accurate. You know, order of magnitude. They're also more more expensive. Okay. Um, next question. This relates to the first solution that you were talking about. How much does the DPC track to cost or download it from the Fluke site for free? You can download a demo copy for free. I don't know what uh, current demo copy I think will run for oh, say 30 days or so. Uh, I don't know what their current pricing is. So check with your local agent to see what that current pricing is. Okay, last question. Is there a time stamp on the result report? And I believe this was back when you were talking about the first solution as well. All, if the time is set correctly on the 15, on the 754, yes, it's time stamped properly. All these solutions, there's a clock in either the 754 or in the 1586 or in your computer. And if that's set properly, you will properly time stamp all of the results. Uh, question going back to MetTemp2. Can MetTemp2 calculate chi-squared values for the uh, residuals? 
Uh, no, it basically just calculates the residuals, and, and the, the, the set points and the residuals. Uh, it doesn't really give you a, a it, it leaves you with the residuals and, and leaves you with the ability to assess whether that fits correct. Uh, we typically require to, to, to calculate coefficients, we typically are going to require an overdetermined solution, if you know what that means, which we need at least one more test point than the number of coefficients that we're going to calculate. Um, we'll do our best, our, you know, uh, do our best curve fit in terms of a, a linear regression curve fit uh, to give you the results. Okay. Uh, next question is: Can MetTemp um, update a manual MetCal procedure? No, it cannot. Okay. Um, just jumping back to the Q and A screen to see if any came in there. Um, declare the temperature of the cold junction in this calibration. Do you think it is important? That question came in either during your first or second um, solution discussion. So both of uh, the 15 and the uh, 74 measure the cold junction. They don't report what the measurement of that cold junction is. They do use that cold junction measurement to compensate the molt uh, the measuring and provide a compensated millivolt measurement so that you can actually look at um, um, when, when I'm trying to back calculate to temperature. Uh, we actually have done that, uh, but we document what that uh, cold reference junction temperature is. We do include the uncertainty of that measurement in our uncertainty specific in our specifications. So. Okay. Uh, next question: Is there no way to set auto set point on the dry well calibrator? I don't know what that means. I don't either. You did. Um, okay. Uh, so, Bavin, if you can um, clarify that question, we'll be happy to address it. Um, and uh, so, please send it through the chat window of the host. Um, next question, also, I'm not sure about, but maybe you'll know, Wally. Um, can Fluke design the certificate as we need? Um, we could develop a custom procedure for a custom template for you. Um, we'll typically charge for that engineering work. Uh, we could certainly do that. It's really not that, that difficult of a job to do. Um, Word doc document, you, you, you can modify a template. Uh, but if you'd like to pay us to, to edit a Word document for you, we certainly could do that. Okay. Question, um, do these have time zones and daylight saving settings? Uh, the board does not, not, 1586 does not, they assume that they're set with local time settings. Uh, met respect the time zone settings of the computer. Okay. Does the DPC track to work with the Fluke 715? Does not. 715 has no serial communications capabilities. Okay. Same question for the 725. Uh, 725 is a manual tool only. So no. Uh, Follow-up question: How soon will it be possible to transfer Met Temp data to Met Team? I don't. Uh, uh, doing that at this point in time um, and I believe the reason for that is because Met Team um, handles CSV imports fairly quickly and easily and, and Met can export data via a CSV path so I, I think we've let that we, we've kind of let off as a, as a you know not really high uh, um, uh, and typically a lot of our Met Temp 2 customers not using Met Team to manage their assets, so using Met Temp 2 as an asset manager as well. Um, but um, it, it's something that was a really critical thing with Showstopper, I'd certainly talk to your local flute guy and see what uh, what, what solutions they might be able to offer. And that I believe we could probably, through, CI, through our custom, custom, custom installation and training group, could probably write a script to export a CSV file for you and 
import it. Okay. Next question: Does the Deep Sea Track Two work with the Fluke 9009 dual drywell? DPC works with the 754. It's designed to work with the 754. It's designed to connect to any other Fluke product. Okay. So, Wally, that's all of the questions that I see in the chat window at this time. Um, last question from me. You talked about a number of solutions and mentioned a number of um, products. If people wanted to learn more, more about this, where would they turn? Probably the best place would be, um, I would I would certainly ask them to connect with your local Fluke agent uh, as a good resource because most of them, um, in fact, I, at this point, probably all of them have gone through a presentation or training like this and be able to help you with a lot of questions. Uh, the other one would be if it's, uh, you know, would use our temperature support at flutecal.com email address uh, and certainly uh, send us questions and, and can that way and can address uh, getting you responses. Well, thank you, Wally. Um, this has been a terrific. Um, information. I appreciate you handling all the questions as well. Uh, that's it for me. Do you have any concluding comments? Uh, the only com kind of, com I've, I've thrown, thrown this just so I'll, I'll, you can see this slide, you'll get it in the deck. It kind of does a quick comparison of the of the results or of the different systems. Again, there's not one that's best for every application, so uh, you may find one that, that is the right mix of uh, uh, our complexity and um, results.